I'm going to uh, comment as I go through again to break down the chapter, just to try and give some background that might help. Uh, the difficulty is in Genesis 34, we get a narrative with no authorial uh, comment, uh, no steer in the uh, chapter itself on what to do with it, um, how to reflect on it. It is the power of story that it it's designed to raise questions, to um, make us ponder. Um, and so what that's what this chapter does. Uh, there are, however, some indicators in the surrounding material and in other parts of scripture, which means I'm just going to take perhaps a little bit longer today uh, just to help us to, to get to grips with this chapter rather than being able to pull out uh, a simple application. Um, and, and I think it's just worth noting at the end of chapter 33, where we left off yesterday, that as Jacob has returned to the promised land as, as he was commanded by uh, God, um, he settles 33 verse 18 um, at the city of Shechem. Uh, and, and camps within sight of uh, that uh, city. Just that language uh, casts us back to Lot, camping within sight of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, in comparison with Isaac, who never settled in the area, and Abraham, who moved very quickly from Shechem to the Bethel region. And this, along with the, Jacob's only experience of Bethel, perhaps should have encouraged him to move on. And uh, it's at the beginning of chapter 35, that gives us the impression that he should never have stopped here um, at all. Uh, but instead of going all the way to Bethel, um, which is only about another day's journey, uh, he settled here for a quiet life. I guess it's a good place to do business, being near the city. Uh, there were lush pastures around Shechem, um, uh, very tempting, uh, like Lot, uh, attracted by the worldly values and, and pitched his tent too near this Canaanite city. Um, he'd forgotten his calling at this stage to be a, a stranger and a pilgrim. And I think that's just a worthwhile lesson for us to bear in mind um, as we head into chapter 34. We can get really caught up with the things of this world, the making of money and uh, setting up lovely homes and enjoying the benefits of, of, of this life, that we forget that we are pilgrims. We're, we're traveling on our way uh, to a promised land that our citizenship is in, in heaven. Um, and actually, Genesis 35 verse 1 suggests that Jacob's taken his eye off the ball, really, in terms of worshipping uh, God and he's got distracted from where he ought to be and it does just uh, challenge us to, to think carefully about where we've landed where we are settling in life um, are we too near to um, places situations things uh, that are distracting us from what God has called us to do and uh, the importance of the reminder that we're not yet home uh, so let's uh, delve into chapter 34 and all its unpleasantness uh, verses 1 to 5, uh, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, sorry, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the woman of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hittite, Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, his sons were in the fields with his livestock. So he did nothing until about it until they came home. As far as we know, Dinah's between 13 and 15 um, uh, at this time of this story. And uh, as far as we know, she's the, the only daughter of Jacob and uh, Leah. In fact, she may well be the only daughter of, of Jacob. And it's a bit strange, really. Why is a 13 to 15 year old girl going out to visit uh, the women uh, of the land? Is she unaccompanied? Does anyone know where she is? Um, does raise questions, doesn't it, about uh, looking after our kids and uh, raising them. Uh, and she's taken by the local prince and, and raped. Now, the, the irony, the sad irony here is that he's actually afterwards really attracted to her. He's, his heart is drawn to her. He loved her, spoke tenderly to her. But but after, he's taken her for himself, raped her. Um, and uh, it's just so the wrong way around, isn't it? And that was very typical of the Canaanite peoples who were going to suffer God's judgment for the way that they had behaved. And sadly, it's it's a reflection on the, the, the mess that our own societies are in, that lust and love are so mistaken and, and that power in, in sex is so misused. Um, and and, and what, a, what a messed up, mixed up approach to, to love a girl uh, and to rape her. Uh, what on earth is going on? And what's even worse, that, that when Jacob hears the news, he does absolutely nothing. He seems totally unmoved. Compare with how he responds to hearing that uh, his favourite son, Joseph, might be dead. He, he barely seems to bat an eyelid. 
And I think it's sadly worth just reflecting for a moment that uh, we have brothers and sisters in other countries uh, where this happens regularly. There are Christian communities in places like India and Pakistan where their young girls are kidnapped and they are forcibly married off. They're just taken. And actually the Christians are in such a small minority that they can't appeal to a neutral justice system. It, the odds are stacked against them. The police won't touch their cases. And at that point, what do you do? And so is, is that the context Jacob's in here? I, I don't know. But um, it does remind us that we do live in a very broken world and, and terrible stuff happens. And uh, there's not always straightforward answers. So it's what a, what a horrible thing to have to deal with uh, as a family. Um, so that's defilement in those opening verses. Now look at the deception of verses 6 to 24. And Shechem's father, Hamor, went out to talk with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the fields as soon as they heard what had happened. They were shocked and furious because Shechem had done an outrageous thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. But Hamor said to them, my son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, let me find favour in your eyes and I will give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like and I'll pay whatever you ask me. Only give me the young woman as my wife. Because their sister Dinah had been defiled, Jacob's sons replied deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father Hamel. They said to them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will enter into an agreement with you on one condition only that you become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. Their proposal seemed good to Hamor and his son Shechem. The young man, who was the, the most honoured of all his father's family, lost no time in doing what they said because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of the city to speak to the men of their city. These men are friendly towards us, they said. Let us live. Let them live in our land and trade in it. The land has plenty of room for them. We can marry their daughters and they can marry ours. But the women will agree to live with us. Sorry, but the men will agree to live with us as one people, only on the condition that our males be circumcised, as they themselves are. Won't their livestock, their property and all their other animals become ours? So let us agree to the terms and they will settle among us. All the men who went out of the city gate agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem and every male in the city was circumcised. So Jacob almost seems unmoved by what's happened, but the response of his sons is very different. They, they can't hide their shock and their fury for the outrageous thing that's been done. Uh, their shock or grief is the same word used of God's response to the wickedness on earth in, in, in Noah's day. And they're, and they're right in their indignation. It was a thing that should not be done. It's terrible. Uh, and Jacob now gets caught between the fury of his sons who want revenge and this marriage proposal from Hamor, and actually just becomes a passenger in the uh, ensuing negotiations. He's totally uh, absent. Uh, and in a sense, verses 8 to 10, this marriage offer shows the main threat for God's people, which is beginning to unfold. And it's not the threat of becoming victims of violence as much as being just assimilated into what everyone else is doing. Intermarry with us, share our wealth, become one with us is the invitation. It's exactly what God has to warn his people against in places like Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 5 and Ezra 9, 1 to 2. Uh, intermarry, settle, become rich, solve the problem between us, just cover over the sin. Notice there's no sorrow expressed at what's happened from Hamar or Shechem. There's no repentance, there's no apology. And it may well have been the plan all along to take her and do this to her so that they can claim her for themselves. And Shechem now speaks instead of his father, offer, offering to pay any any bride price they set as long as he gets the girl. So here's here's the offer. Um, we'll 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 appease. We'll we'll cover it all over. Just let us pay, and we'll take her, and you can become one of us, and it'll be all fine. There's there's no need to worry. And then on the other side, you've got Jacob's sons now, who become literally mini Jacobs. They reply deceitfully. They pretend to peace if the uh, locals will get circumcised. Uh, they say, make us a confession and then we'll intermarry and settle and we can all be one and happy. And so Shechem and Hamor return to the city to persuade the other men that actually this is a really good deal. Um, 
it's motivated by Shechem's delight in Jacob's daughter, but actually they're saying this could be really lucrative. Here's a wealthy man and, and, and we can share our wealth together and they encourage the rest of the inhabitants of Shechem to agree to their terms. And so every male in the city is circumcised, not as a sign of their covenant relationship with God, but as a tool to getting what they want out of God's people. And God's people are using the covenant sign deceitfully to gain what they want, as we'll see in a moment. And so here is something precious in God's sight being used as a tool for selfish gain. And folks, that's not new. Baptism has been used in the same way. It was used as a political tool with Alfred as he uh, fought against the, the Vikings and, and, and with intermarriages and the baptism of uh, certain Viking households, you know, things were, 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 were supposedly brought to peace. And, uh, and, and it's, it's been used as a tool in, in terms of the church gaining power by baptizing people who clearly aren't believing but brings them under their banner. And it's been used by people who clearly aren't believing as a tool to get what the church is, is offering. And, and in all of this, there's no mention of the Lord. We hear nothing from Jacob as his sons walk in the same ways that he used to walk in. And uh, it's just such a mess, all this deceit. And then having seen defilement and then deceit, now preachers headings, verses 25 to 31, we see destruction. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out in the fields. They carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the houses. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you've brought trouble on me by making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they replied, should he have treated our sister like a tr prostitute? The extent of the deception now becomes clear, doesn't it, as the pain of circ circumcision sets in and the men of Shechem are completely incapacitated. And Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, attack the city and kill every male, including Hamor and Shechem, and rescue Dinah. It would seem then that the other brothers joined in the looting of the city and carrying off all the women, children and plunder. And finally, Jacob finds his voice for the first time in this whole narrative and criticizes them for their violent response because it makes them literally a bad smell to the locals and leaves them very insecure. Jacob seems rather shockingly concerned for his own safety rather than for his daughters or for his family honour. And, and you can rightly understand the son's defence and the implied criticism of Jacob's inactivity as their sister has been treated like a, a prostitute. But what do we do with all of this? How on earth do we read it? Well, I think in some ways we ought to recognise there is no easy answer here. Life often is very complex. It can be very brutal. And, and sometimes we are naive to think that there is a clear black and white path through uh, these horrible situations. And I think you, you have pitted against each other here, the appeaser and the avenger. Uh, and, and they're mutually exasperated with each other. And they're, they're, they're swayed by fear and fury. And, and neither of them are uh, anywhere near true, true justice. The, the one wants to just buy it off. Uh, the other wants to, to take ultimate revenge and wipe out. And both of them are not productive reactions to evil. I mean, what's shockingly absent is at no point in this story to Jacob and his sons confer and pray. There's never time for reflection. There's never time for prayer. Uh, and, and sometimes actually uh, in the complexities of a certain situation, that, that this is the, the first thing we should do. This should be our first course of action, to, to stop, to pause, not rush into any action, to pray. And then to reflect that there are correct and wise ways to resp respond to evil and worldly defilement, and, and, and mature leaders, in a sense, should, should take responsibility for acting decisively. You see, the young, the z the young zealots, as evidenced by Jacob's sons here, usually react correctly to the evil that their, their motivation is right that this is horrible it ought to be punished but their tactics then completely bring dishonor to god and make them incredibly vulnerable attempting to destroy or punish evil through lawless or unrighteous acts should not be confused with righteous indignation and will never in the long term solve the problem of evil 
rather actually the righteous need to seek justice and oppose evil in a manner that brings honor to God and his covenant rather than dishonor. Now it's, it's interesting uh, that uh, later Old Testament law, Exodus 22, 16 and 17, allowed for a bride price, price to be paid in, the, in exactly this situation without marriage being required. And so actually, is there a sense then which justice is achieved to a degree without vengeance or, or compromise? Is, is, is there something worth aiming at here that actually uh, Hamor should have, uh, sorry, Shechem should have paid for his sin with the bride price without gaining the bride because of the way he's treated her? But at the same time, we do have to remember that we're not always in a position to get justice in society. Regularly, not all the facts come to light. Regularly, uh, the system is stacked against justice. And we need to remember that, that we will not always see justice in the world. And, and that should just make us long for the return of Christ all the more. It's, it's very clear that um, Simeon and Levi have acted wrongly here. As later in Genesis, chapter 49, verses 5 to 7, they're, they're passed over for leadership of God's people because of the swords. Uh, their swords are weapons of violence, it says. They're not going to be uh, leading God's people because of the way they responded here. They've, they've discounted themselves from leadership because of the wrong response. So, so there's lots for us to reflect on here, isn't there? Um, are we settling in places that are going to lead to compromise? Uh, are we in danger of just fitting in and observing, ob absorbing the world's way of doing things? And, and on the flip side, are we taking matters into our own hands in a way that disgraces the name of God? And uh, we really do need to pray that uh, we would be helped to respond to right in difficult situations and, uh, uh, and to expect, actually, that in this world, we're not always going to see justice, which leads us to thank God that Jesus is coming again. There is a day of judgment when all will be put right. And uh, we can thank God that, actually, though we should be put right on that day, in his grace, we are rescued and forgiven. Uh, the penalty has been paid for us that we deserve.